Amen. Thank you, worship team. <clears throat> well, have you ever hit rock bottom? When you thought things could not get worse, and then they do, and you find yourself beyond your limits, beyond your ability to do anything about it, there's nothing you can do to fix it. Well, as we continue our series through the book of First Samuel, we are coming to chapter 30 this morning, and we're going to find that David has hit rock bottom. David, the future king of Israel, the one who had so much hope and so much promise, had grown discouraged, and he was despairing, and he didn't trust in God any longer to protect him from the hand of King Saul, the first king of Israel, who was chasing David because he was jealous and he wanted to kill David. So David fled and God protected him again and again and again. And then finally David came to a point where he said, I, at some point Saul's going to catch me, I just know it. We read that he said in his heart that one day Saul's going to catch him and kill him. And so he fled to the land of the Philistines. And while in the land of the Philistines, he cast himself at the feet of King Achish, king of Gath. And he took him in. And he asked Achish for a city of his own. And Achish gave him Ziklag. And so David and his 600 men lived in the city of Ziklag that had been given to him. And from there, he raided the lands of the Amalekites, Gershuites, and the Gerzites, uh, and, but he told Achish he wasn't doing that. He told Achish he was raiding the lands of southern Judah, pretending to be an enemy of Israel completely, when in fact he was not. And so he, he fled and he hid in this land. And then Achish came a knocking on David's door to call in on the debt that David now owed King Achish. And he said, you and your men are going to serve me in war. You're going to be my personal bodyguard. And David and his men, not having much of a choice, followed King Achish and the Philistines to battle Israel. Israel, David's own people, the people he was going to be king over. And this was going to be a lose-lose situation for David. And either he was going to have to try to backstab the Philistines and perhaps risk his life and the lives of his men and the lives of his families that they left in Ziklag, the women and the children, in Philistine territory. Or he would have to fight against his own people, Israel. And there's really no coming back from that to become their future king. But by God's grace, God used the other Philistine kings to send David and his men back. If you remember from last week, they're like, what are these Hebrews doing here? Achish, why did you bring them? They're going to betray us. And they sent them back to Ziklag. And so David and his men, by God's grace, went back to Ziklag. But as they're going, it's a long journey. It's a three-day journey. And as they're coming up on Ziklag, they see smoke. Not the, the cook fire kind of smoke. The smoke of burning what should not be burning. The city of Ziklag was on fire. And pillows of black smoke were coming up from it. The city where their wives and their children were. And this morning we're going to see that David and his men come up on a scene that no man wants to come up on. And in this moment, all the safety that David had won himself was lost. The prosperity and security that David ensured by his own hands when he went to the Philistines and lied to Achish and got the city of Ziklag, subjecting himself to the Philistines and raiding these, these other territories. All of these lies came to naught. They all came to burning. Everything that he'd stolen from the desert tribes was now stolen back. Oh, and it's not only David's life that's in flames right now. It's all of the men who had been following him. All of their lives are in flames. All of their families are gone now. And David has hit rock bottom. So open up with me to 1 Samuel chapter 30. And we'll see how this unfolds and how David responds to losing everything. Beginning in verse 1 of 1 Samuel Chapter 30. Now, when David and his men came to Ziklag on the third day, it was, three day, it was a three-day journey again from 
um, Aphek, where they were, to Ziklag. And that is kind of a significant number in Scripture, is it not? Jonah spent three days in the belly of the whale. Jesus, three days in the grave. David, three days spent returning from his running from God's purposes for him. A three-day journey back. Continuing on. The Amalekites had made a raid against the Negev, that is, southern Judah, and against Ziklag. They had overcome Ziklag and burned it with fire and taken captive the women and all who were in it, both small and great. They killed no one, but carried them off and went their way. And when David and his men came to the city, they found it burned with fire, and their wives and sons and daughters taken captive. So the only mercy here is that nobody was killed. The women and children were alive, but who knows in what condition? Who knows what had been done? Certainly they were going to be made slaves. And who knows what cruelty the Amalekites would inflict upon them. And every husband's and father's minds would be terrified for his family and what they were going through at the hands of people like Amalekites. As we've seen throughout Scripture, the Amalekites are opportunists. They're desert raiders who like to pick on Israel. And when all the armies of the Philistines and all the armies of Israel went north to fight at Aphek, the Amalekites saw an opportunity, and they attacked the southern regions of Judah and Ziklag, which was in Philistine territory. So they took this opportunity. And we see from things like this why God's judgment was upon the Amalekites and why God called Saul to carry out his judgment upon them, which Saul failed to do. Saul failed to do, and here they are again picking on Israel. And later, we'll see, years later, uh, we'll see Haman, the Amalekite, Uh, would try to commit genocide against the Jews uh, if it were not for the work of Mordecai and this very brave and wise Jewish woman named Esther uh, who thwarted his plans. But back to our chapter this morning, verse 4, Then David and the people who were with him raised their voices and wept until they had no more strength to weep. At the sight of their city burned, their families gone. David's two wives also had been taken captive, Ahinoam of Jezreel and Abigail, the widow of Nabal of Carmel. And David was greatly distressed, for the people spoke of stoning him, because all the people were bitter in soul, each for his sons and daughters. David is now officially at rock bottom. The men who would follow him anywhere, give their lives for him willingly, now spoke of stoning David. It was David who brought us here to the land of the Philistines. It was David who led us astray. It was because of David that we marched up with the Philistines to do battle against our own people, Israel. This is David's fault. Now we've lost everything. And it was in this moment at rock bottom that David finally turns his gaze up to God. The one he'd been ignoring for over a year as David did things his way instead of God's way, as David ensured his own safety in his own lying and scheming way rather than trusting in God who delivered him again and again and again. Isn't that what happens when we do things our way? We we, we push God out of our mind. We don't go to him. Uh, Because if we go to God, we know we're going to come face to face with our unfaithfulness. And what we've been doing, and doing it our own way. And we don't want to deal with that, so we don't go to God. This is what was happening with David. He didn't go to God. Till everything was taken from him. Now David was on his knees with nothing left. No clever scheme he could come up with. No lie that he could come up with to get himself out of this situation. He had nothing. Nothing. And perhaps we'll see. That this is exactly where God wants us, on our knees before him. It's in those moments that he can reach into our hearts and turn our gaze again up to him to remind us that we can't do it on our own, not by our own strength, not by our own scheming or contriving. It is only by casting ourselves 
at his feet. And so David, in this moment, does not blame others. He does not blame God for what's happened. He knows this is holy and solely upon him. And this is what makes David a man after God's own heart. This is one of the things that separates Saul from David. And we see it so clearly here that where Saul would blame, this is not my fault. I didn't do this. David takes responsibility. He doesn't seek to blame anybody else. Instead, he goes to God. And we read on, but David strengthened himself in the Lord his God. Finally. Right? Have you been with us through this series? It's like, finally, again, man. No longer is he going to himself, saying things in his heart that aren't true. He's going to God, our true strength. David, for a time, forgot himself. He forgot who God called him to be. He, he'd forgotten the faithfulness of God, but now his eyes have been opened to how short-sighted that was, to, to how silly and foolish that, that was, to think that, how, how in pride and in discouragement he'd ignored God for so long. But now he again strengthens himself in the Lord. And what does he do? Verse 7, And David said to Abiathar the priest, the son of Ahimelech, Bring me the ephod. So Abiathar brought David the ephod. And the ephod, remember, it's a prayer robe, like a ceremonial uh, robe that you use to, to pray, to go before God. Verse 8, And David inquired of the Lord, Shall I pursue after this band? Shall I overtake them? Will God answer? Yes, he will. He answered David, Pursue, for you shall surely overtake and shall surely rescue. Not just overtake, but rescue as well. That's a good word from God. And now it's on. And David's back. He's back. He doesn't hesitate. He doesn't wait one second. He trusts in God's response immediately. Verse 9 says, So David set out, and the 600 men who were with him, and they came to the brook Bezor, where those who were left behind stayed. But David pursued he and 400 men, 200 stayed behind who were too exhausted to cross the brook Bezor. They found an Egyptian in the open country and brought him to David. And they gave him bread, and he ate. They gave him water to drink, and they gave him a piece of a cake of figs and two clusters of raisins. And when he had eaten, his spirit revived, for he had not eaten bread or drunk water for three days and three nights. And David said to him, To whom do you belong, and where are you from? He said, I am a young man of Egypt, servant to an Amalekite. And my master left me behind because I fell sick three days ago. He fell sick three days ago. Where was David three days ago? David was being turned around and sent back to Ziklag three days ago by the grace of God. And by the grace of God who, who orchestrated this event before David even inquired for the aid of God. He was orchestrating this event. He caused this young Egyptian slave to fall sick three days ago. And here he is in their path just as they have no idea where to go next. And suddenly they have an inside guy. God is awesome and demonstrates his power in such subtle ways that only served to further glorify him. It's like God could strike the Amalekites with lightning and be done with it, or he could put in David's path a sick and hungry young Egyptian who is on the brink of death. And because they chose to help him, because they chose to give him food and water, he is now able to give them the very information they need to find their families. That's God's sovereignty, and it's beyond us. It's beyond us, but it simultaneously, see what it does, it simultaneously trains us in righteousness, and it gives us opportunities to partner with him while we are accomplishing his plans and his purposes and his promises. He told David he would overtake them, but David still had a role to play in it all. He had to trust in God, and also he had to act righteously even to strangers and those who were about to die 
lying on the side of the road, which, by the way, sounds like another story, doesn't it, that Jesus tells us about a man lying on the road side about to die. David chose to help him. Moving on, verse 14. Now the Egyptian is telling David what happened, um, how he'd been left behind by the Amalekites when he fell sick. Verse 14, we had made a raid against the Negev of the Cherethites and against that which belonged to Judah and against the Negev of Caleb, and we burned Ziklag with fire. And David said to him, will you take me down to this band? And he said, swear to me by God that you will not kill me or deliver me into the hands of my master, and I will take you down to this band. And when he had taken him down, behold, they were spread abroad over all the land, eating and drinking and dancing because of all the great spoil they had taken from the land of the Philistines and from the land of Judah. So David and his men had come upon them, and they're having a party. The Amalekites are, are just partying hard. They're dancing without a care in the world. And now David gets to do what David does best. Verse 17, and David struck them down from twilight until the evening of the next day. And not a man of them escaped, except 400 young men who mounted camels and fled. <laughs> Okay, so <laughs> David, this is, it's kind of funny. David only had 400 guys with him. It was, they, 200 had to stay behind because they were too exhausted. He only had 400 guys with him. But these 400 young men get a mention. Oh, oh yeah, it's like a few of them escaped, 400 <laughs> on camels. It, it, it was tw almost 24 hours of David and his men striking down the Amalekites and you got to think, you know, they're spread across the land. They, there was probably at, at least, I'm thinking, 10,000 Amalekite men that they struck down, at least. Um, and, uh, and 400 got away. <laughs> so this was, this, this was not a fight. It's not like they, they drew up battle lines against each other. This was a slaughter. This was a slaughter. They were going through, and they, they slaughtered all the men. Because um, they, they were caught totally unaware, and they were just having a party. And, and obviously, God delivered the Amalekites into the hands of David and his men. Verse 18, David recovered all that the Amalekites had taken, and David rescued his two wives. Nothing was missing, whether small or great, sons or daughters, spoil or anything that had been taken. David brought back all. David also captured all the flocks and, and herds, and the people drove the livestock before them and said, this is David's spoil. And how, how quickly public opinion changes. Huh? But this, this is a great victory, man. And God gave David everything back from, you know, the jewelry to the plates to the cups to the children. Not one was missing. All of it was retrieved. Everyone was rescued. Verse 21, Then David came to the 200 men who had been too exhausted to follow David and who had been left at the brook Bezor. And they went out to meet David and to meet the people who were with him. And when David came near to the people, he greeted them. Then all the wicked and worthless fellows among the men who had gone with David said, because they didn't go with us, we will not give them any of the spoil that we have recovered, except that each man may lead away his wife and children and depart. You weren't there. You weren't there. You don't, you don't get to share in this. You were too weak and tired. You hear the tone, right? The tone of, we took care of it for you. Take your kids and your family. Here you go. Go on your way. You didn't earn this. They had it in their mind that this was their victory, that they had won this, and it was no one else's, especially not the guys who stayed behind. But David said, you shall not do so, my brothers, with what the Lord has given us. He has preserved us and given into our hand the band that came against us. 
Who would listen to you in this matter? For as his share is who goes down into this battle, so shall his share be who stays by the baggage. They shall share alike. And he made it a statute and a rule for Israel from that day forward to this day. And here we see the leadership of David. And at some level, we each have leadership responsibilities, don't we? To lead ourselves, to lead those God has put in our lives. So it's worth exploring a moment, I think, taking a look at the leadership of David. And we're going to see a lot more of this type of leadership from David as we, as we go on through the series, um, as we go on into 2 Samuel, which we are going into 2 Samuel right after 1 Samuel. Don't you worry. <laughs> We're just getting started, everyone. Uh, But this is a big moment. Uh, This sets the tone in many ways for what kind of leader David is going to be. Will David bring together or will David tear apart? Will David act righteously or will David act for his own self-preservation? How will David differ than Saul? We will see David will differ in many ways from Saul. Where, Where Saul blames others... David takes responsibility. Where where Saul needs to be kept from acting wickedly by his own men, they're like, Saul, don't do this. Don't kill your son, Jonathan. Don't kill the priests. Where Saul needs to be kept from acting wickedly, David keeps his men from acting wickedly. Where Saul only cares about appearances and preserving his reputation, David is willing to stand against his own men. To preserve righteousness, to preserve righteousness. Just as here, David stands against his own men who went and fought with him. They bled and they sweat and they suffered and they triumphed together. And now these same men who have in many ways earned the right to have their opinions be heard, they demand David not share the spoil with those who were too weak to fight on. But David does not cave to their demands. For he owes them, yes, but what he owes them the most is to lead them. That's what he owes them the most, to lead them on paths of righteousness. And sometimes that means being disagreeable, telling them what they don't want to hear in order for them to not give in to their worst impulses. David is a father to his men even though many of them are probably older than him. He leads them. He's a leader that brings together, a leader that inspires, that brings the best out of those around him. And he has set in place a statute and a rule that that essentially says all the army shares in the victory, just as all the army would share in a defeat. If we win, everyone wins. So everyone do your part. And David does this by reminding them that all they have is from God. All they have is from God. He says, you shall not do so, my brothers, with what the Lord has given us. He has preserved us and given into our hand this band that came against us. So first and foremost, guys, we only have all this stuff because of God. It's only because of God. Don't get a big head about this victory. This is not something we could have done without the help of God. That should be glaringly obvious. So so don't be a bad receiver of God's gifts. Don't receive a gift from God, like let's say the forgiveness of all your sins, (laughs) and then go and be totally unforgiving of anyone who's ever wronged you. That's egregious. Jesus tells a parable about that one, too. A guy who's forgiven, let's say, $10 million. A a debt that he couldn't repay in his entire life by the king. And then the same guy goes and demands a $10,000 debt from his friend. And because his friend couldn't pay him in that moment, he had him thrown in jail. That is not a good receiver of gifts. You were forgiven a $10 million debt and you can't forgive 10000 You see what that says. I was forgiven, but these guys don't get to share in that forgiveness. It's all for me. That's why the Bible calls these guys wicked and worthless. Wicked and worthless men. They were very effective at their work on the battlefield, 
but they don't understand righteousness and the grace of God. They don't understand gratitude. They're just playing the game of hungry, hungry hippos. <laughs> and just, just grabbing as much as they can in front of them. Trying to get the most little balls, right? Thinking it's a zero-sum game. If, if he wins, I lose. That's not how the kingdom of God works. We are to be those whose eyes have been opened to the spiritual reality that in Christ, each of us has gone from rags to riches. <laughs> From dirty, stinky, smelly rags to being clothed with the righteousness of Christ. We need to see that. How much we've been forgiven. How much grace God has poured out upon us. That we are sons and daughters of God. Full inheritors of the kingdom of God. Princes and princesses of the king. The true king. The true king. Not like a pretend king on earth. So in leadership, remember who's truly on the throne and help others rem- remember that too. God is on the throne. God is the one who is sovereign. It's by his grace that each of us woke up this morning. Nothing good you have is not from his hand. Said otherwise, every good and perfect gift is from above, from the Father of lights. So good leadership points to God and gives credit to where credit is ultimately due. A good question to ask ourselves is am I leading myself and others into righteousness, or am I not? Am I not? And often it's not what we do, it's it's what we don't do or don't say and don't allow to be done or said that's the marker of this, and this is a good gut check. I was reading this, I was like, God, help me to be as courageous as David, to lead others and myself into righteousness to prevent them from making a short-sighted mistake. Man, that's a good gut check for us. When we're in leadership. Which leads us to a second lesson of leadership we learned from David, is not to play favorites with the more public roles uh, than the -the behind-the-scenes people. And everywhere is susceptible to to doing this, to to playing favorites to those who are more charismatic, gifted communicators, and then turn a blind eye to their shortcomings, even if they're egregious. And we've seen this among uh, the church, unfortunately. Uh, Recently, in recent years, many egregious sins have been, and abuses um, have been exposed, and, and churches have unfortunately protected abusers above the abused protecting the institution over the people that it's put in place to serve. And it's horrendous. And wicked and worthless fellows are responsible for this. Imagine if David was not the leader he was. Imagine if David was one of his wicked and worthless men, and he gave in to the mob when they demanded the rewards, and that those who didn't join in the fighting got nothing. This precedence that would be set in place by this is a dog-eat-dog world. Continual infighting, backstabbing, and injustice cloaked in and labeled as justice. This is wicked and worthless leadership, catering to the influential and allowing them to trample over people who are behind the scenes. But because David is a good leader, David has strengthened himself in the Lord, he doesn't cave into those wanting their own way for their own benefit, but he looks to what is good for the whole. And what will bring unity to the whole? What will bring about the best situation for his men and not allowing them to go and give in to their worst instincts? He proclaims that for as his share is who goes down to the battle, so shall his share be who stays by the baggage. They share alike. And because they share alike, they work together. They work together. They are unified Just as we are, many parts but one body, many serving different functions and purposes, and yet we are one body united by Christ who is the head, and we love and we serve one another. That's how we are to lead, following the way of Jesus. This is the way that he taught us, that if we want to be first and greatest and leader, we must become servant of all, just as our Lord Jesus came to serve and not to be served. So we follow his example.
And the Apostle Paul teaches us on leadership in the church. He says in 1 Corinthians 12, he says, For just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ. For in one spirit we were all baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and all were made to drink of the one spirit. Skipping ahead to verse 21, he says, The eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you. Nor can the head say to the feet, I have no need of you. On the contrary, the parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And on those parts of the body that we think less honorable, we bestow the greater honor. And our unpresentable parts are treated with greater modesty, which our more presentable parts do not require. But God has so composed the body, giving greater honor to the part that lacked it, that there may be no division in the body, but that the members may have the same care for one another. If one member suffers, all suffer together. If one member is honored, all rejoice together. Now you are the body of Christ and individually members of it. As one body, we, like the army of David, share in the victory. We share in the victory. When we send short-term missionaries, not everybody can go. We can't all go overseas. We can't all go to different countries. But when we send them, we share in the fruit of their labor. When we support missionary efforts globally, we share in that work. The New Testament tells us that when we enter into glory, everything that we invested in, uh, the things of this world, will be burned up with fire. This is, it's gone. But the things that we invested in that are eternal will withstand that and will last for eternity and will add to our glory, which we can then present to Jesus and say, this is for you. This is the eternal work you've called us to. What a wonderful thing. See, Joanna has a herniated disc. I don't know if you've seen her walking around, you know. Uh, She's got a herniated disc right now. She's really in a lot of pain. And she can no longer go and do the Czech English camp with us this year, which we'll be going to in July. Um, But that doesn't mean she doesn't share in it. That doesn't mean she doesn't share in the work there. She absolutely shares in it. Just as each of you also share in that work there. Jesus says, store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in or steal. That's what we're doing here. (laughs) When you give uh, financially to KCC, uh, 10% automatically goes to global missions or disaster and crisis relief. What a cool thing that we're part of things that are happening around the world, and the rest goes to things that are happening here and now. Ministry in in this city, in this town. We're all part of these things. We all share in it. We share in the work of the Lachelles. Lisa, I'm so glad to have you here. We We've supported her for over 20 years. How are we sharing that work? Man, they, they're on the front lines. Yes. But we're, we're with the baggage, <laughs> you know, with the man. And we're like, okay, we're going to send you resources and help out and pray for you. And we all share in that work. It's pretty amazing to think about. That we will meet people in heaven whom we've never met here. And, and we will know that it's part of our investment that they are there with us. And since we're talking about it, I found a cool article that talked about 10 ways to invest in the kingdom of God. So I'm just going to share them real briefly with you. One is, the first one, support a missionary. Second, disciple a new or young believer. Third, help in disaster relief. Four, help send a child or teen or a youth uh, to a youth retreat or a Christian camp, which are coming up this summer. Five is cuddle a baby. (laughs) That's a fun one. Six is sponsor Compassion International Kid. Seven, make care packages for the homeless. Eight, give to or volunteer at a crisis pregnancy care center. Nine, uh, we have these bottles here. Uh, Nine, uh, use your talents to bless the needy. Uh, Ten, buy books for a Christian school. And we're going to talk more about number 10 next week. Okay, so be thinking about that. Um, Okay, but let's finish up this chapter here. Verse 26, when David came to Ziklag, he sent part of the spoil to his friends, the elders of Judah, saying, here is a present for you from the spoil of the enemies of the Lord. 
It was for those in Bethel, in Ramoth of the Negev, in Jatir, in Aroth, Error, in Sifmoth, in Eshtemoa, in Rakal, in the cities of the uh, Jehemelites, in the cities of the Kenites, in Hormah, in Borishan, in Athak, in Hebron, for all the places where David and his men had roamed that we've never heard of. <laughs> okay, look what happens here when we understand that every good and perfect gift is from above. We become generous. We become generous. David shares generously in this great victory that God gave to them. He shares with his friends and those who've helped him before. He's not a king who takes, as Saul has been. He is a king who gives and who shares. This is the king of God's choosing, the shepherd boy, who courageously leads mighty warriors into righteousness. This is the kind of king that people have longed for. And David's time of despair and discouragement is over as he once again leans into God and answers the upward call of God in his life. So may we never be those who forget from whom we've received so much from, that we would grow miserly and and stingy with what God has blessed us with. May we be those who give freely and joyfully from the bounty that God has given us. For that is what the one true king has called us to do. Because David was only a foreshadow of the one who was to come. Our Lord Jesus, who gave freely of all of himself to us all. And because of that, we are those who give as well. Give generously in grace. As we are those who are grateful, grateful to our loving Father. And so we want to be those who join in God's generosity, who share in his eternal plans and invest in the things that are eternal to be part of the mission of God to proclaim to all the world the good news of Jesus, the good news that this life is not all there is. There is hope. There is hope. He has come and he's coming again. And there's forgiveness for our sins as we can be reconciled to God and have restored relationship with him for all eternity. What a joy. <laughs> what peace, what strength that gives to us and how that instills within us a gratitude that leads to generosity. Let's be that kind of people. Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your great love for us. And Lord, if there's anybody here this morning who is near or at rock bottom, God, would you pour out your grace upon them? May they lean into you and strengthen themselves in you as David did. Knowing that you are faithful. Knowing that you meet us in the depths of our despair. God, we thank you that you are our eternal hope, and that nothing could separate us from your love. So, Lord, would you strengthen us this day that we may be courageous leaders, as David was a courageous leader, who led his men on paths of righteousness, even though he had to disappoint some of them. Help us to do so, Lord Jesus. Help us to lead like that, to lead our own lives like that, to lead others like that. Help us to recognize where every good and perfect gift comes from. Help to remind us when, when we want to withhold good from, from someone else because you know, we feel like we, we deserve more or whatever it is. God, remind us of this story. Remind us of how David led. May we do the same. May we do the same. So God, if there's anybody here who has not come to you, has not repented of their sins, I would ask that your Holy Spirit would impress upon their hearts that today is the day of salvation. That we but put our faith in you, Lord Jesus, repenting of our sins, and you are faithful and just to forgive us from all unrighteousness, to cleanse us, Lord, to clothe us with new garments. So, Lord, give us the courage to do that as well, to repent. 
Help us to be those after your own heart that when we mess up, we say, sorry, will you forgive me? So God, would you lead this church? Would you lead your people? Would you lead us on paths of righteousness? For you are the head. You are our true king. You are our true leader. So we seek to follow you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, let's stand for our closing song. You made this sin.